called uh, this talk Seeing the Unseen, uh, because we're going to focus a lot of the day on evaluating Barrett's tissue, and you'll see why the unseen piece is very, very important uh, in managing this disease. So I will share with you that I, I do work with a number of companies that make uh, some of the technologies we're going to talk about today. Um, and, and I'll give you a full survey, including the ones that I don't work with directly. And I, I want you to, to know that um, there is such an importance of, of embracing new technologies as they appear on the scene and, and giving them a shot and evaluating and getting the data to figure out whether or not they fit into the algorithm. And that's sort of been my passion as I've built my clinical and clinically oriented research career. Uh, because I, uh, if, if we don't try new things and we don't encourage um, our colleagues in academics and industry to try and come up with new and better ways to address a situation, then we won't make the progress when there's a need that's been evidenced. And you'll see why that's important in, in just a few minutes. So recognizing that there are a lot of folks here who probably the last time they heard the phrase Barrett's esophagus may have been in medical school, might have been in residency, um, and they probably remember there was a Dr. Barrett, but not a whole lot else behind it. Let's start at the basics and work our way forward. So what is Barrett's esophagus? Barrett's is uh, the replacement of the normal stratified squamous epithelium of the esophageal lumen, uh, of the tubular esophagus, with cells that resemble uh, the lining of the small intestine, goblet cell or intestinal metaplasia. And that metaplastic process is thought to be a reaction um, and an, uh, to the exposure of the esophageal lumen to refluxate, um, primarily for a long time, and we still believe it's probably the primary driver is, is acid, but there's increasing knowledge that bile and other potentially caustic substances, um, that their presence in the esophageal tube is what's leading to the metaplastic change. And, and the pathophysiology kind of makes sense. As, as much as I have devoted my life to this uh, organ uh, that sits there and it's fascinating and lots of things can go wrong with it, essentially it's a tube that carries things from the back of the throat to the stomach. And most of the time it kind of sits there empty. At least it should be empty. And when it's not empty because there are things sitting in it because they either don't clear or because they backwash from the stomach, the esophageal wall gets upset. And it's not used to seeing acid and bile on a regular basis. In fact, it shouldn't see it at all. Um, and the intestinal lumen, the intestinal wall, small bowel wall, is used to it. And it expects to see acid and bile as it makes the, the, the digestive process move forward and develops chyme and passes things forward for nutrition and then ultimately for production of stool. So what happens is we think is that, that Barrett's is this reactive change where the, the walls, the stem cells in the walls due to ongoing damage say, you know what, let's make a barrier that's a little bit less irritated by the presence of this fluid that's not supposed to be here. And we think that's what's happening with the, the metaplastic change. And this is what it looks like under the microscope where you can see those special, the specialized intestinal metaplasia, you see the villi and you see the goblet cells which stain with the alcyon blue. So this is the hallmark of, of, of Barrett's esophagus. And in the United States, the presence of these goblet cells on biopsy is required to make the diagnosis. So the best epidemiologic study we have of Barrett's actually is from Sweden, where a guy named Runkainen randomly endoscoped a thousand adults he basically pulled out of the phone book. And what he found was that the prevalence of, of celia, I'm sorry, of, of, of Barrett's is 1.6% of the population, very similar to what we see with celiac. And if you think about all of the gluten-free products we see in our stores today and how, how um, hip it is to talk about dealing with celiac, certainly the same thing isn't happening with Barrett's. And a large part of that may be with the first red circle that you see there, the first red oval, only about 56% of the patients who were diagnosed with Barrett's when they were endoscoped had filled out on a symptom questionnaire at the time of endoscopy that they had upper GI symptoms. So nearly half, 44% of the patients had no symptoms at all, but yet their reflux was so severe that it was causing precancerous changes. That's the reason why Barrett's is such an important disease is because it has no symptoms itself. And it's often not associated with symptoms and we have to do a better job of finding it because ultimately there are going to be consequences that we'll talk about shortly so over the last several decades and you see this only goes through the late 90s but the curves have continued we're finding more and more barrett's and we think that that's because of the epidemic of obesity that we have here in the united states 
as well as improved uh, training of our gastroenterologists and improved availability of endoscopy. But the studies have shown that it's not that increased capacity in endoscopy and more uh, utilization of endoscopy that's generating more diagnoses. It's a, an increased prevalence in the population. And the histologic progression of Barrett's is very, very important. So the vast majority of patients have non-dysplastic disease. You see the villi on the left-hand side uh, of the screen here. They're relatively well organized. The, the cells are in relatively good spatial orientation to one another. It's just not what you should see when you take a biopsy of the tubular esophagus. When you get the low to low grade dysplasia and then high grade dysplasia, which you see in the center and the right panels, there's more, there are more and more changes both at an individual cellular level, for example, the nuclear cytoplasmic ratio, but also the orientation of the cells on, uh, with respect to one another. They sort of crowd each other, they fall on top of one another, you lose the, the nice um, uh, architecture of the villi and they become uh, more irregular. Uh, all of these changes demonstrate increasing accumulation of mutations that ultimately can lead to the boogeyman in Barrett's, which is adenocarcinoma of the esophagus. And the overall risk of developing this Barrett's-related carcinoma is approximately 0.3 to 0.5% per year for patients who have had been diagnosed with non-dysplastic Barrett's esophagus. Now, the prevalence of esophageal cancer compared to all the other cancers that we deal with in and outside the GI tract in the last several decades, we have not made particularly good strides. You could see the blue dots going way, way up, multifold increase uh, in terms of the, the detection of this cancer and the, and the prevalence of it compared to lots of other cancers. And you see those all listed at the bottom of the chart. So this is, this is really important for us. And again, it matches our, our population changes with the epidemic of obesity moving forward uh, and more of a sedentary lifestyle, poor eating habits, uh, lack of exercise, all of those other things uh, are paralleling right along with this. Now, there have been several studies that have come out in the last decade or so that have discussed the progression to Bar of Barrett's esophagus to cancer. Here's where that 0.3 number comes. It's lower than what we had seen before. And it's important to note, and I put this slide up here, because several of these studies did not come from the U.S. population. They came from Europe, which is a different group. Um, and so it's important to realize, again, that, that the uh, external validity of those studies to the American population is probably reduced. There have also been studies here where there's been a pullback in correction, corrective letters that have been published uh, in the journals after these came out. So as a reminder, take everything you see with a grain of salt and put it in context of all of the different papers that are coming out. There's a really good paper that came out that, uh, right around this time that showed that the progression rate was about 0.5% in a US VA population, probably much more akin to what we see in our Barrett's practices here than what they see over in Scandinavia. Now, the reason why I showed you the, the dysplasia piece earlier on the slide, and I talked about that being important, is not only um, do we know that, that that indicates accumulation of, of mutations that are suggesting a progression toward cancer, but also the progression rate per year to adenocarcinoma, once dysplasia is detected, ramps up massively. And so once the horse is out of the barn and you have dysplasia that's been detected, you really have to think about managing the patient differently than if you see non-dysplastic disease. And you can see that these guidelines from the American College of Gastroenterology are 20 years old, but the point still resonates. And this, the reason I show this slide is because a lot of the developments I will show you came out, of a, uh, came out as a response to this, uh, this guideline that Dick Sampliner uh, published quite some time ago. And you can see that once we detect dysplasia, if we keep people in an endoscopic surveillance cohort, we follow them routinely to look for the progression of cancer. And back in Dick Sampliner's day, um, we did that until they developed cancer and then we sent them for esophagectomy. And then we sent them for some relatively barbaric endoscopic ablation techniques, if not surgery. And then now we've got the generation of technologies I'll show you in a, in a few minutes. But we know that once we put them into a surveillance cohort and we catch the, the development of cancer or advanced pre-cancer earlier, the survival looks much better. You'd much rather be on that fuchsia Kaplan-Meier curve than on the aquamarine one. So let's talk about that new generation of endoscopic eradication therapy options. And this is not seeing the unseen part. This is laying the groundwork as to why seeing the unseen is important. So I mentioned just a second ago that in the past, when you were diagnosed with Barrett's 
with high grade dysplasia or cancer um, that you went to esophagectomy. That was the preferred option. And then we had a technology called photodynamic therapy or PDT that revolutionized the field um, and involved the ability to, to disperse a red light after a medicine was injected intravenously and that uh, activated oxygen free radicals, which then killed off the, the dysplastic and neoplastic cells. Worked great, except for the fact that it gave you six to eight weeks of severe photosensitivity, and the majority of patients needed to be admitted to the hospital um, for pain control with IV medication. And so not a particularly patient-friendly approach, uh, at, while much more effective than some of the earlier therapies that we had out, and certainly less barbaric than uh, esophagectomy. But what I'm going to show you has really changed the paradigm because now we have a much safer and efficacious and well-tolerated set of technologies that we can use to evaluate the uh, to treat the disease. So in 2021, our workhorse for the vast majority of Barrett's ablation endoscopically is done with a technique called radiofrequency ablation or RFA. Basically, it's like heating a hot dog in the microwave. When you, when you give out the radio frequency energy, which is deployed either through a balloon catheter or through these paddles, which you see on the bottom of the slide, a fixed amount of energy is delivered to the tissue. And that, there's a frictional heating of intracellular water that comes as a result of deploying that energy. So it's not necessarily a direct thermal burn. It's creating um, the cell boiling of the intracellular contents um, through the delivery of that energy and the cell cooks itself, much like when you microwave a hot dog, okay? And so being able to do that and, and to deploy the energy in a metered dose um, at, at, and evenly across the tissue increased the tolerability as well as the efficacy and the safety of endoscopic treatment of Barrett's. And this study, which I will show you here, coming out in, uh, in May of 2009 in the New England Journal, demonstrated, and I'm just showing you the key pieces here, that on the left-hand side, we were able to get rid of dysplasia very effectively. You can see the black bars were the degree, uh, were the patients who received the radio frequency energy and were able to demonstrate on follow-up biopsies that all of the dysplasia had disappeared from their Barrett's compared to the sham control, which you see in the light gray bars. And on the right-hand side, you can see that radiofrequency ablation effectively reduced progression to cancer. The gray bar is showing the percentage of patients who progressed at 12 months to cancer versus the group on the uh, right-hand side of each comparison, the dark bars, which are the patients that received RFA. So basically we were able to stop that progressive sequence that I showed you earlier in its tracks using a technology that only took about a half an hour, 45 minutes to do in an outpatient endoscopic procedure that the patients found relatively easy to tolerate and the vast majority said they would do again in the future uh, if they were given the chance and had the need to do so. And so that was really a seminal moment in the management of Barrett's esophagus and with several other trials coming out um, and in the context of this New England Journal article, all three of the major GI societies have now included endoscopic eradication therapy and particularly radiofrequency ablation for management of dysplastic Barrett's and in select patients with non-dysplastic disease, depending on the society. Now, there are a couple of other techniques that use cryoablation. So we, we deliver cold energy instead of heat energy to eradicate the tissue. And I just want to show uh, both of those to you as we offer both the, radio, the, we offer the radio frequency ablation as well as both of these cryoablation techniques in our Barrett Center. But liquid nitrogen spray cryotherapy uh, delivers on minus 196 degrees centigrade liquid nitrogen through an endoscopically placed catheter uh, under endoscopic visualization and guidance um, to freeze the tissue and then thaw the tissue and freeze it again. And that freeze-thaw cycling creates a, a destabilization leading to an apoptotic pathway in the metaplastic and dysplastic cells. Unlike radiofrequency ablation, cryotherapy, in particular this liquid nitrogen spray cryo, does not require a flat surface to treat because it's just getting the tissue cold enough that leads to that reaction within the cells. And so if you have a patient who has a stricture, if they have a tumor, if they've got a very tortuous esophagus, um, you're able to use this uh, technique instead of the radiofrequency ablation to effectively eradicate the entire Barrett segment. And as you can imagine, once you've got one area that looks like it has uh, 
uh, neoplastic tendencies, you want to get rid of all of the precancerous tissues. And there's some very nice data uh, that has come out for liquid nitrogen cryotherapy, although not the abundance that we've seen with radiofrequency ablation. Uh, this meta-analysis or multi-center study from Gorbani published now five years ago demonstrated eradication rates in the 80 to 90 percent range for dysplasia and in the 60 to 70 percent range for all Barrett's. So pretty similar to what you saw with that New England Journal article that I showed you before. We also have a balloon-based option where we can deliver nitrous oxide within a self-contained balloon that's deployed endoscopically in the distal esophagus. And here you can see the diffuser on the upper left side spraying out the, uh, the nitrous oxide. Not as cold, the treatment is not as deep, um, but it's done endoscopically, uh, done very quickly. It's the fastest of all of the three tr uh, treatments that we have. Again, not as, uh, as uh, damaging to the tissue in that, uh, you don't have to scrape off the coagulum that forms after radiofrequency ablation, um, but you get a nice effect. And in fact, several studies that have come out, including this one from Mimi Canto uh, in, at Johns Hopkins and, and a multi-center group, uh, demonstrating, again, ablation efficacy and safety with minimal uh, side effects and, and, and uh, risks to the patient. So in the setting of these three techniques, you can see now why the paradigm is pushed towards endoscopic eradication therapy uh, at an earlier stage for Barrett's in the dysplastic stage rather than let, waiting for a cancer to arise and then treating potentially metastatic disease. So dysplasia seems to be the key here, right? It's, it's, it's the golden goose. It's what we need to aim for because if we detect the dysplasia, we know that we have an effective and safe and well-tolerated technique to get rid of it before the cancer even forms. The problem is, as my friend Stu Speckler said now almost 20 years ago, is that dysplasia has no distinctive gross features. So the vast majority of patients with dysplastic Barrett's that I look at um, and my colleagues look at with the endoscope, even a high definition white light endoscope, the latest version, we can't necessarily see anything that definitively says this is an area of dysplasia, take a sample here versus the rest of the area. It all looks the same. It all looks like that salmon colored tissue that I showed you at back on that very early slide. And so while we, we can try extensively sampling the, the, the tissue, um, we can't eliminate the possibility that we shoot the dart at the wrong spot and the sample we look at under the microscope is, uh, is not the dysplastic area and we understage the tissue. And the real problem that we have is that the best um, approved and endorsed technique we have for sampling the esophagus right now, something called the Seattle Protocol, which was uh, devised several decades ago by a gentleman named Brian Reed out in Seattle, demonstrated that if we take four quadrant biopsies of the esophagus, as you see here in this slide, every one to two centimeters throughout the Barrett's, we increase the likelihood that we find dysplasia compared to just randomly taking a couple samples here and there. And that's great, but it has some problems. And that is that this is a time consuming process. You can imagine if you have an eight, nine, 10 centimeter area of Barrett's and you have to take four biopsies every one to two centimeters, you're gonna wear out your wrist by putting the biopsy forceps down and taking it out. And you're probably gonna wear out the patients of your nurse and technician and anesthesiologist because you're getting quite a long procedure. And so the adherence to following the Seattle protocol is actually quite low particularly in the community setting. And it's only about 50% or so uh, on some really good studies that were done by my colleagues, Julian Abrams and Charlie Lightdale from Columbia. Uh, now uh, back in 2009 was when it was published. Here's the real kicker though. Look at that third bullet. Even when you follow that protocol, which is the best accept, universally accepted protocol we have for sampling right now, it still leaves about 95% of the tissue unsampled. So what's your potential for error in missing the dysplastic focal area if you're leaving 19 out of 20 pieces of Barrett's unchecked and, and not examined under the microscope? And that's why there's a real need, right? We know we can intervene. We know we can stop progression to cancer. And yet we only sample about 5% of the tissue and hope we got it right as a means of staging somebody and saying, oh, you look good, come back in three to five years for your next endoscopy, when during that time a cancer may already be forming. And so there are a couple of ways that folks have been trying to devise new methods, new approaches to evaluating the Barrett segment to make sure that we don't miss those 95, that 95% of tissue that may harbor dysplasia and even cancer. 
And so here are a couple of technologies that have been integrated or that we've been looking at integrating into our algorithm. The first is relatively uh, universally available, and that's digital chromoendoscopy. In this particular case, I'm going to show you one example of that, which is called narrow band imaging. And what it does in a nutshell is to use very specific wavelengths of light, as you see blue and green light here at the bottom of the, uh, of the slide where those wavelengths specifically highlight the vascular pattern and the surface layer uh, of the tissue uh, versus sort of giving you a, a, a full set as if you turned a, light, a white light on uh, in the room and you looked around to see what you saw. This sort of allows you to focus in on that vascular pattern, the mucosal surface and the capillaries to see whether or not there are patterns that suggest architectural distortion that's indicative of dysplasia. And here you can see a very nice example of it, the exact same sample of Barrett's on the left and on the right hand side. The left left hand side is the white light, the high definition white light, and the right hand side is the narrow band imaging. And you can see if you look at it, it almost looks like a shag carpet, but it's flat. Those that's the tissue micro, the tissue architecture and the vascular pattern and the capillary pattern being brought out by only using the blue and green wavelength of light. And what that allows us to do is to look for those focal areas that look different than the spots in the surrounding segment of Barrett's and target those focally different areas on visual inspection for uh, biopsy. And so that you've got, you've got, instead of throwing four random darts every two centimeters, now you're really looking for that, that abnormal appearing area, subtly abnormal appearing area, and sampling it to see if you can improve your detection. And in fact, you can. My friend Herb Wolfson from the Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville uh, demonstrated that quite some time ago now, that NBI picks up a lot more dysplasia. Uh, and also, if the area looks really good on, on NBI, you probably don't have to worry about the dysplasia being there, although it's not as good uh, as some of the other things that we'll talk about shortly, and I'll show you why. Confocal laser endomicroscopy is another technology that's out there. And CLE basically works uh, by sending out a low powered laser light through an objective lens, bouncing it off the tissue and then collecting um, the grayscale images that come back into the same focal plane, therefore confocal, uh, and getting a real time image at a really microscopic tissue level, cellular level, microscopic level. The, the rate, the, um, ability to see down to a resolution of about one micron at an individual cellular level is possible with this uh, through the scope probe based device, which you can see here at the bottom of the screen. And you see the two images, the non dysplastic Barrett's, you see those goblet cells, sort of long, thin palisade looking cells um, compared to the stratified squamous brick epithelium um, versus the very disoriented areas of darker and lighter um, and not well organized Barrett's associated adenocarcinoma on the right hand side of the screen. But you notice that this is a little bit of a paradigm shift in how we're looking at the cells. We're not slicing them um, height wise and looking at them as you would for an H and E stain uh, from a surgical pathology biopsy from a forceps biopsy. We're actually kind of hovering above the cells and looking at the tops of each of the crypts and the tops of the surface. Uh, almost like Tom Cruise in Mission Impossible when he's suspended from the wire and dangling over the floor and looking out over it to avoid getting the tripping off the uh, the laser uh, alarm, right? So, so this is a totally different way of approaching it, but you can see that the distortions in the architecture look very similar to what we can see on the, the H&E stains on the standard forceps biopsies, and yet it's an optical biopsy. We don't have to take a physical sample to see this. It's a real-time evaluation down to a, a, a really, really microscopic level with one micron uh, of resolution, that's pretty remarkable. The problem is that you can only see the very top layer of the cells and you can only see a very, very small area. You can imagine stack how many microns across is that if you're looking at individual cells. So you're very, very good at looking at these small areas and we can replace the physical biopsies by using um, the white light and the narrow band imaging and the, the confocal laser microscopy together in, instead of white light narrow band imaging and physical biopsies. But we're still only looking at those very small areas uh, of the tissue and scanning an entire circumference of the esophagus over a long Barrett segment could be a very time consuming procedure. And also the dye that we inject, the fluorescein dye to be able to see the contrast and see those images 
washes everything out after about seven to 10 minutes. And so you've got a limited window and you really can only look at a much more focal area. So this is kind of what CLE is in a nutshell, right? We're really, really good at looking at the individual uh, straws, but if we're trying to find a needle in a haystack, we're missing an awful lot of the haystack. And that's the shortfall with confocal endomicroscopy. So there's gotta be something in the middle there that gives us a little bit more of a balance of resolution and depth and surface area covered. And that is the technology called volumetric laser endomicroscopy or VLE. This is basically a very high powered ultrasound, almost like a CT um, that provides high resolution cross-sectional real-time imaging of the tissue. So again, it's, it's, a, it's a relatively real-time process. Uh, with a resolution that's pretty good. It's down to about seven microns, not the one micron of confocal, but, but still much better than you would see with the high definition white light or that narrow band imaging that I showed you. The difference here is that you can see up to three millimeters deep into the tissue. So you can see burgeoning dysplasia and cancer that's not up to the surface level yet, that's hiding below the surface. And in addition, in about 90 seconds, you can evaluate a six centimeter circumferential scan of Barrett's and accumulate the images. And I'll show you how that works in a second. So the, the coverage piece that was a problem with the confocal end endomicroscopy is not a problem with the volumetric laser endomicroscopy because you're able to cover so much more ground. And here's a, a nice cartoon of how this works. You can see we blow up a balloon that's inflated after being passed through the, uh, through the endoscope and a laser is pulled back within the balloon to evaluate that six centimeter segment uh, of tissue. The scans are all placed almost like a CT and you can scroll up and down through them and switch side to side and blow up certain areas for, uh, for a high powered view um, to look for abnormalities in the wall of the esophagus and then laser mark those for, uh, for tissue sampling either with forceps biopsy or a resection of an area of the esophageal wall. So if you think back to first year of medical school in histology class, this is what stratified squamous epithelium should look like. It looks like a layer cake. And in fact, that's what I call it when I'm teaching my fellows. I say, this is the layer cake appearance, it tells you that we have a healthy tissue. When you see a loss of that layering and you see these little bubbles, these dots of white, uh, un, uh, white hypo uh, pigmented area within the scan, that tells you that there's a distortion of tissue architecture that's not allowing the villi to be packed in uh, to maximum concentration. And you're seeing these gaps because of the distortion. And that's an indicator of dysplasia, as I showed you on the H&E slide some time ago. So that loss of layering in the presence of these irregular ducts or glands and these bubbles within the wall are an indicator of, uh, of dysplasia or cancer. And in fact, when we ran an 18 center multi-center multi trial, um, looking at a thousand patients who had this uh, technology performed very early in its life cycle, we found that we were able to pick up in over half of the patients, at least one area suspicious for those changes that was not seen on white light, that was not seen on that narrow band imaging, was not seen on confocal endomicroscopy. And in part, that's because of the depth of coverage as well as the breadth of coverage um, and the resolution down to seven microns to look at a more microscopic architectural level uh, compared to just scanning the surface with a special light. And so the number needed to test with a biopsy taken by uh, guidance from this abnormal VLE scan uh, to confirm an additional case of dysplasia on histology was only 8.7 once the VLE had, had identified such an area. And so this is really a remarkable technology. Unfortunately, the company that makes it fell victim to COVID because when we stopped doing all elective endoscopies, the vast majority of these procedures went away. And so right now we're hoping that um, someone is gonna pick up this technology and reboot it and continue to use it because they've actually developed an artificial intelligence algorithm to go along with this, um, that you don't even need to look at the, at the scan. The computer tells you within the, the, the catheter system where the abnormality is and where you should take a biopsy. And so it's becoming kind of PhD or press here dummy technology. It's unfortunately just been a victim of COVID. And I think that the development for that reason is gonna be stalled, uh, hopefully for just a little while. So let's talk a little bit about physical tissue sampling. We just talked about optical sampling of the, of the Barrett segment. Let's talk about physical sampling for detection of that metaplasia, dysplasia, and cancer. And so 
On the left-hand side, you can see another depiction of what the uh, forceps biopsies are like, right? You take the samples, you get those four red spots. That's your two centimeter area. This is as if the esophagus was filleted out for you. But unless you hit those darker areas with the LGD for low-grade dysplasia or the HDGD for high-grade dysplasia, you've now understaged the patient as having non-dysplastic disease, reassured them that nothing bad is going on. Well, in fact, it is. What if you were, however, able to sample up and down that whole segment, as you could see indicated by the red lines on the right-hand side of the screen, and sample a much higher percentage of the tissue? Well, that's the thought with wide area transepithelial sampling and computer assisted analysis, or WATS or WATS 3D. And what WATS is, is the use of an abrasive brush instrument, which you can see there in the center of the slide, pass through the endoscope to sample the Barrett's tissue. But because it's a stiff bristled brush made out of wire and not a soft brush uh, like a feather duster, it actually grabs tissue microbiopsies all the way down to the level of the lamina propria. Um, to evaluate under a microscope for, um, for the presence of those changes. And so you get individual cells, but you get a lot of these tissue fragments and cell clusters that can be assessed, and they can be up to 150 microns thick. Now, on a standard, and a standard microscope, that doesn't allow you to see anything because you're just going to get too thick a glob. But I'll show you how this works in a second with the aid of neural network analysis. And what, what happens with the Watts 3D is that you get something called extended depth of field processing or EDF. And the computer that's attached to the microscope is able to section the slide microscopically and, and uh, optically at three micron slices instead of the whole 150 micron slice as a single evaluation, and then reconstruct those into a single focal plane uh, that becomes a three-dimensional image. And I'll show you a cartoon of that in just a second. Uh, and what, what happens after those, uh, that 3D reconstruction occurs is that the neural network that's been trained with hundreds of thousands of images picks out the hundred or so most abnormal areas and presents them to the pathologist who's sitting at the computer terminal in the microscope for analysis and says, here's what I think is the most abnormal spot. Take a look and tell me what you think. And you make the diagnosis based on what I'm showing you. So the, the computer doesn't make the diagnosis. It just facilitates that the right areas, the most abnormal looking areas within the slide and the 3D reconstruction are presented to the pathologist for review. And here's a cartoon of how that happens, right? So these are the standard four centimeter, uh, four, four quadrant biopsies. Unfortunately, our dysplastic Barrett's never blinks yellow for me. I'm not sure why, but it doesn't make it very easy to find it. And so instead, if I go across with this stiff bristled brush and I pick up all that extra tissue and then look at that tissue com on, compared to the four quadrant biopsies under the microscope, and I'm able to get down to the level of the lamina propria, as you saw on the right hand side, uh, much deeper down uh, and much more uh, elaborate biopsies and, and tissue um, microbiopsies instead of individual cells. And then I'm able to use this three-dimensional reconstruction to assess the architecture of the glands that you see and then have the AI tell me where the areas look most abnormal. I'm really able to get a much better evaluation of the tissue in addition to the standard H&E slides that are made from the cell block and the immunohistochemical stains that are used to look for markers that indicate dysplastic progression. And in fact, in a study that we did looking at nearly 13,000 patients with Barrett's or suspected Barrett's that were evaluated uh, at multiple sites across the country, I think it was 40 or so sites, you could see that we were able to pick up quite a bit extra Barrett's and dysplasia in the top and the bottom uh, tables there compared to the forceps biopsy alone by adding in the Watts uh, adjunctive technology for additional sampling. So we had 150% more Barrett's that we found and 242% more dysplasia that we found compared to the forceps biopsies alone. And here you can see those rates with the number needed to test to find any additional Barrett's of five and 61 to find an additional case of dysplasia with no reported complications for use of this additional brush to take sampling. And so um, that was in the community setting. How about an enriched Barrett's population in an academic setting where we know everybody is following that Seattle protocol and they're taking their time with the special imaging that I showed you? Well, we looked at 160 patients who had, had known Barrett's either being surveilled to see if they had developed dysplasia 
or who had dysplasia that was known and they were being mapped out before that endoscopic eradication therapy, the ablation therapy was to be performed. And so what we found in that 160 patients is that the forceps picked up seven cases of either high grade dysplasia or cancer, areas where there's complete consensus that we should be ablating or, or, or resecting that tissue. Watts picked up an additional 23 cases of high-grade dysplasia or cancer for an adjunctive yield of 428%. And here you can see that in graphical form. So of the 160 patients, 30 patients had high-grade dysplasia or cancer. So very, very advanced disease. The forceps in that gray circle found seven and the Watts found 29. And the one case that the Watts missed, it found low-grade dysplasia instead of high-grade dysplasia. So it still found dysplastic disease. It still indicated the tissue was more concerning, um, but it did not miss any cancer or high-grade and call it non-dysplastic, whereas the forceps did that on a routine basis. So you can see here in an enriched Barrett's population, not just a community-based population, where the Watts really makes a difference even in the hands of expert evaluators of Barrett segments. And so in the setting of that stu these studies and several others that have come out, one of the, the, the primary GI endoscopic society, the American Society for GI Endoscopy, has included in their most recent guidelines a recommendation that watts be used as an adjunctive tool to forceps biopsies to take better samples so that we can eliminate or minimize the risk of missing dysplasia um, by using the forceps biopsies only. So then we go to the last section of the talk here, which is what can we do beyond the standard biopsy to enhance uh, our ability to detect dysplasia? And so um, let me show you a couple of things here that are, are really, I think, going to be the future of, of our field in the next decade or two. The first one is actually looking at tissue systems biology or tissue sampling to predict progression, not by the presence of histologic dysplasia at the time that the tissue sample is evaluated, but looking at the milieu for evidence that the right, uh, the right biomarkers are in place, the right oncogenes are there or missing, the right environment is there to foster progression of the non-dysplastic tissue to uh, dysplasia and cancer. And so a company has looked at using 15 different uh, biomarkers and their expression patterns uh, to come up with a risk stratification algorithm. You can see the area under the curve there on the far left side of the screen and the three um, classifications they're using based on the expression patterns and the algorithm that they have, low, intermediate, and high risk for progression. And the, cap and the, and the curves for probability of progression there right in the center of the screen. Um, each patient is evaluated with all of these different biomarkers and then given a risk score, as you see in the lower right. And based on that amalgamation and that risk score, the question is, if you've got non-dysplastic disease, but a high probability of progression, rather than waiting for that high-grade dysplasia or cancer to form, why not take them straight to ablation and prevent that disease from ever getting into play so that you protect uh, the patient from a bad outcome? And here you can see a nice graphical uh, interpretation of the two different patients. The one on the right-hand side was a non-progressor and the one on the left-hand side did progress to high-grade dysplasia. And you can see that the expression patterns, what is expressed and what is not expressed in the different panels below each uh, Barrett segment and the, um, the regular H&E forceps biopsy that you see in B and E, the patterns of staining look very different. And so based on those expression patterns, the algorithm can be run, and then the risk stratification score can come up. And so a lot of us in the Barrett's field believe this is going to be very important because what will happen when someone is diagnosed with Barrett's is that they will get either a diagnosis of dysplasia at the time that they are, um, in, that they are diagnosed, in which case they'll go right to, uh, right to ablation, as I showed you earlier, or they'll be non-dysplastic and it will automatically reflex into a, a risk progression model like the one I'm showing you here, where we'll know if it's non-dysplastic disease unlikely to progress, which is the majority of patients, or non-dysplastic disease likely to progress, in which case we're gonna treat them as if they have what I would call molecular dysplasia and ablate them at a much earlier stage because of what they show us to be their risk profile. Now, what about taking this even a step further? Why are we doing all of this uh, evaluation to find Barrett's 
with an endoscope. It's a very costly, time-consuming, research-intensive or a resource-intensive process. What if we could screen patients for this precancerous condition without even having to have them go, let alone you know, into an endo and an endo endoscopy suite, let alone a GI's office, let alone a primary care doctor's office. You might ultimately be able to go to Quest or LabCorp someday and have somebody have you swap have have a, a nurse or a medical assistant give you a small little capsule to swallow like this program the stito sponge program uh, after a few minutes the gelatin capsule absorbs the loofah sponge opens up and then we pull that loofah through the esophagus and we test the cells that have come off on this mildly abrasive sponge for the presence of a biomarker in this case trefoil factor three that indicates the presence of Barrett's. And so that 46% or 44% of the patients that didn't have any symptoms yet had Barrett's, right? And the group within that 56% who had symptoms but had yet to have an endoscopy because they didn't think they were serious enough to warrant that kind of intervention or their doctor didn't believe that way. All of a sudden now we probably can find that 90% or so of the Barrett's that we in the Barrett's community doesn't don't know exists. We don't know who has it right now because we don't have a cost-effective, minimally invasive, effective screening technique like this uh, cytosponge technique that would allow us to uh, test a lot more people who maybe have an, an uh, episodic reflux disease uh, and symptoms, or maybe fit a demographic uh, profile because they're an obese white male in their 50s, um, even if they don't have any symptoms, where we might want to uh, evaluate those patients, but right now they don't fit a protocol for coming for an endoscopy and utilizing those resources. And in fact, the numbers look pretty good. You could see the sensitivity was up in the 80% range. And if somebody agreed to do um, the sponge test twice, the sensitivity went up to near 90%. And the specificity was about 89-90%. So very, very good numbers. This te technique is not commercially available right now. It's undergoing more testing. The one that is available here in the United States is something called the EzoCheck and the EzoGuard system, uh, where we're actually able to deploy a soft balloon that's inflated right at the bottom of the esophagus. Once it reaches the proper position, it's on a, a small, soft, spongy catheter uh, and is still swallowed by the patient, much like the cytosponge was. The balloon is inflated uh, at the right level to grab the cells along those little ridges on the balloon, and then the air is taken out of the balloon, and the balloon invaginates on itself uh, in order to collect those cells at the right level only, and then not lose any of them as the, the catheter is pulled out the mouth. And then the balloon is clipped into a small jar to, to collect those cells that are spun down and checked for methylation biomarkers. So not the trefoil factor three, but a different process uh, as a means of identifying not only Barrett's, but potentially dysplastic Barrett's based on the methylation expression patterns. So this is a really exciting technique and, and actually um, we're looking at bringing this and doing a trial here to see for patients in the primary care setting where uh, they would not normally go for an endoscopy, but they're going to go for a screening colonoscopy. If we did this first and I picked up uh, a positive test with the methylation biomarkers and did an endoscopy, could we find a lot more of that Barrett's disease without having to wait until it becomes metastatic cancer and presents when the patient has dysphagia? Uh, one more I want to show you, and again, there are a number of different technologies here, but I want to give you a survey of it, is actually to use the tethered capsule of that VLE technology I showed you before. So instead of doing an endoscopy and blowing up the balloon catheter and deploying the laser from within that balloon, we can actually build the laser into this small glass catheter, a glass capsule that the patient swallows and real time get an evaluation. So let me see if I could show you this video from uh, one of our colleagues up in Boston where that catheter is swallowed by the um, graduate student who you could see is not overly excited about doing so, uh, but he did for the betterment of science and patient care. And here you can see those rings with the, the here's that layer cake epithelium, the squamous uh, epithelium I showed you before, but we're getting a real time image that the computer can look at and the artificial intelligence can tell us whether or not it looks like Barrett's or it looks like um, squamous epithelium. And if it sees Barrett's, it can look for those bubbles and the, the abnormalities that I showed you before to suggest whether or not the patient has evidence of dysplasia. So without even having to put an endoscope in a patient, we can actually get a real-time AI-aided evaluation to see whether or not there's Barrett's, whether or not it looks like there's dysplasia, and where it's located um, so that we have a roadmap when we do go in endoscopically for that patient. 
And again, this could probably be done in a Quest or LabCorp at some point in time, as long as they had that uh, technology available. So pretty exciting stuff. It'll be really interesting to see where this goes in the years to come. So let me put it all together and, and wrap up and take some questions. So we know that Barrett's is increasing in incidence, likely as a result of our obesity epidemic. It's putting more and more patients at risk of developing adenocarcinoma and more and more patients we don't know have this disease at risk of adenocarcinoma, which is really a lethal cancer. Recently developed endoscopic eradication therapy options like the ablation techniques I showed you are now proven to be safe, efficacious, and well-tolerated by the patients, which changes our paradigm and allows us to intervene at an earlier point in the disease progression cycle. And so that allows us to say, we don't need to wait for cancer anymore, we can look for dysplasia. And now dysplasia is the turning point, not cancer. And the Seattle protocol, which we have and we've been using and is the most widely accepted form of, of screening and surveillance for Barrett's is good, but certainly not an optimal approach to dysplasia detection to find that key, uh, that key histologic feature that would make us intervene instead of continuing on a surveillance pathway. Optical sampling, taking optical biopsies may improve our forceps biopsy yield and overall biopsy yield by allowing us to biopsy areas of greater suspicion, perhaps even removing um, the, the Seattle protocol so that we only biopsy the areas that look focally abnormal, knowing that the rest of it is probably non-dysplastic, which would ultimately save us time and decrease the cost of biopsies as long as we're able to prevent enough of them from being taken that it equals the cost of doing the imaging technology. And currently available physically sampling techniques like Watts can decrease the risk of missing focal dysplasia by increasing the surface area evaluated and using artificial intelligence and neural networks and other technologies that allow us to assess a physical specimen uh, or an optical specimen much better than we were even just a few years ago. So with more time, with more data, um, using targeted biopsies and wide area transepithelial sampling instead of the Seattle protocol may be the way that we go. And we're not there yet. We need more trials to prove it. But I think a lot of us in the field feel like just taking random biopsies and throwing the dart is going to become passe before too long. And we're going to enter in a much more targeted, um, patient-friendly and time-efficient approach to managing this disease, uh, both uh, non-endoscopically and endoscopically. So with that, I will thank you very much for your attention. I hope you enjoyed the talk and I look forward to taking your questions. Thank you, Dr. Smith. That was a great overview of uh, where we are and the road ahead. Uh, the floor is open to questions now. I see one question in the chat um, from Dr. Priven. Um, she says, which patient should we refer for screening given the high number of patients with GERD we see and what are the criteria for referral? Terrific question, Nina. Uh, I, will I will say this. We have so much of our American population that has GERD symptoms, um, so many that we don't even see in our offices because they get treated by Dr. Google and Larry the cable guy, and they pick up their Prilosec OTC um, over the, uh, you know, out in the pharmacy, and they never get to us. And that's problematic because a number of those folks may have severe enough disease that, you know, they, in the past, these are the folks who, who pop Tums and Rolaids every five or 10 minutes. Um, they may have severe enough disease that, that they need to be evaluated. But there are also a lot of folks that you see in primary care who have, uh, who have clinically established GERD, very clear um, that they've got frequent enough GERD symptoms that they warrant PPI therapy. But we know that only about 10% of patients with clinically proven, quantitatively proven GERD develop Barrett's esophagus. So if 90% of them don't develop the disease, then doing an endoscopy on those folks if they have no other symptoms, no warning signals like dysphagia or blood in the stool or, or, or anemia, um, setting them all for endoscopy is too much. And so at this point, um, there are a number of different risk stratification symptom, uh, uh, systems using demographics that people have. So we know the risk factors for developing Barrett's are folks who are um, older, so over age 50, who are obese, um, who are male, who've had prolonged periods uh, or very intense periods of symptoms before they were brought under control. Um, that's the group that I worry the most about. Um, there's a, a running joke in the Barrett's community that always gets told in the Barrett's uh, lectures where a woman brings her, uh, a, a man who's in his 50s and is obese, drives his wife 
um, who has reflux to the endoscopist for her endoscopy to rule out Barrett's. And the question is, what should the endoscopist do when the woman shows up, given the, the low percentage uh, of women uh, having Barrett's esophagus? And, and the answer, the, the joke answer in the GI uh, lectures is always, tell the wife to be the escort and scope the husband, uh, who, was, who was the original escort, because they're much more likely to have the Barrett's. Um, and that's probably true, but if a woman, especially I see a lot of women in their 20s and 30s who had eating disorders uh, in their teens and had prolonged periods, for example, the bulimics, where they were doing a lot of regurgitation and bringing up acid and bile um, and have uh, affected their lower esophageal sphincters, they're now at risk. So to me, it's, it's symptom duration, symptom intensity, um, and then those demographic factors, the obesity, the Caucasian race, the male, and the age that really lead me to think about who needs to be risk stratified with an endoscopy uh, to, or to, needs to be go through risk stratification and then be screened for Barrett's in that way. Well, with the risk issues, if you assess every patient for tobacco and alcohol, because those are the major contributing factors, and that maybe is that the reason why males have more of the Barrett's, I'm not sure, but it was a superb talk. My grandfather died of esophageal cancer, so I've kind of tuned into this, and I'm very excited by what you what you've shown here. It's very very exciting to have uh, non uh, invasive ways of detecting disease early. But lifestyle must accompany um, the not only the analysis but then the follow up care. So, um, how much history do you take on those issues? How much counseling do you do on those issues? And obesity is a whole second third factor of, of difficulty with controlled lifestyle for especially those at risk, but it seems like 100% people at risk, even though 10% get the bad disease. Right, so Norma, I'm gonna take a guess that your grandfather did not die of esophageal adenocarcinoma, but most likely esophageal squamous cell carcinoma. And the reason why I say that um, is because in the last 30, 40 years, as GERD has become the epidemic it has, we've actually seen a switching of the prevalence curves for, um, uh, for adenocarcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma. Adenocarcinoma 30, 40, 50 years ago was quite rare. And squamous cell, which really is the one that's famously linked to drinking and smoking, um, was very prevalent. And with smoking cessation efforts, um, I can't say we've done a great job with alcohol moderation efforts, particularly during COVID, but um, then certainly there are more folks who, who perhaps pay more attention to their alcohol. But in the setting of the, uh, the obesity um, uh, epidemic, we're seeing a lot more GERD. We know now that the risk factor, the primary risk factor for development of adeno, which is the GERD over smoking and drinking, although obviously GERD is facilitated by alcohol and smoking is a carcinogen. So there is some factor at play there. We've actually seen them switch. Um, and so, um, so I would say that, um, you know, that I think, um, you know, we, we do have to pay attention to that history. And certainly we still see plenty of patients with squamous cell carcinoma, um, but the GERD piece has become increasingly important in the history and worth the time in the primary care setting to really hone in on if somebody says, yes, I've had reflux or heartburn or especially trouble swallowing or something like that. Thank you. We have a question from Dr. Seward in the chat. He asked uh, if you can comment on disparities in detection and treatment by ethnicity, race, uh, region of the country and access to an academic medical center. Great, thank you, Samuel, for the question. I, uh, I think I, I touched on this a little bit before when we were talking about the, the risk factors. And I, I always say that the majority of the patients with Barrett's uh, are, are white, but I have my fair share of patients in my career that I have treated of all different ethnicities and backgrounds. And again, gender um, being primarily male, but that, uh, that certainly has changed as well. Uh, I think, and, and, and especially with obesity is making women a little bit more uh, uh, at a risk for it, though there is still definitely a gender imbalance. In terms of region of the country and access to medical care, um, I would say the, the fatter the area, <laughs> to use, you know, the more obesity that there is, the more likely we will see Barrett's there um, because of the link to GERD and the way that central obesity uh, plays a role in, in the pathogenesis of GERD. Um, and access to medical care, I would argue um, less so for, um, for, de for detection of Barrett's and more so worrisome for, for esophageal adenocarcinoma. Uh, 
because if someone is not paying good enough attention to you, risk, uh, seeing those risk factors in the group that do present symptomatically, they're not getting a scope until they develop dysphagia, they can't swallow, they get admitted to the hospital, and then we've diagnosed them with a, a cancer that's large enough um, that it has metastasized by the time we detect it. And that's unfortunately, stage four is the majority of patients that we detect with the over 18,000 adenocarcinomas a year that are found uh, in the United States per the SEER database. Thank you. Uh, is, there any, is there any relation between achalasia and, and Barrett's? So not, so that's a great question in, in terms of achalasia and Barrett's as a connection. So achalasia is the failure of relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter to basically close the trap door between the esophagus and the stomach, um, and accompanied by the failure of peristalsis, effective peristalsis in the tubular esophagus. Um, it's very interesting. You would think that achalasia should prevent you from having uh, Barrett's and cancer of uh, adenocarcinoma of the esophagus because of the fact that if you close the trap door and you can't get anything forward, you also can't get anything backward. But interestingly, there have been a subset of patients that many of us have found in our centers who had Barrett's initially and then ultimately developed achalasia. And we're not sure why that is. The pathogenesis is yet unclear. Uh, the one you have to worry about that's in the literature is after about 10 years, of, uh, 10 years following a diagnosis of achalasia, squamous cell carcinoma uh, risk increases in those patients. And we think the reason why is the stasis of the esophageal content. So not necessarily the acid on the way down, um, but the stasis of the contents that have a poor time clearing the esophagus, even after you've done a myotomy or some intervention to, um, to relax the sphincter because of the lack of peristalsis and the poor esophageal clearance. And following... Uh... I'm sorry, we've got, we've got to wrap it up at this point. It's 9 a.m. Uh, Mike Smith, thank you so much for such a great presentation. It's really a delight for us to have you in our midst. And to know we have such expertise in this important area. If folks want to follow up, of course, with Dr. Smith offline, or also, Mike, if you just give a plug for our new faculty in GI who also has an interest in motility disorders, uh, we'd love to hear from you. And again, thank you, Michael. Our pleasure. And Kim Cavallari, who Dr. Stewart mentioned, and I are, are, uh, are working hard to, to take care of your patients with esophageal diseases, esophageal symptoms. And uh, please reach out to us by email uh, or EPIC if you have a patient that you'd like to discuss and uh, consider for consultation. And Kim sees patients at West 60th Street, is that correct? Uh, 425 West 59th. West, West, excuse me, right, West 59th. Thank you again, Dr. Smith, a wonderful talk. Great, great to have heard all this great information.